Hello, Bill. Good morning, Matt. Welcome back to the DMZ, everybody. So much has happened uh, since you've been in the DMZ. Yes, that, that is true. Um, it's almost a, a, a different world. And, you know, um, in some cases, Bill, I would say, um, and I don't want to be too optimistic. Uh, we have this feeling of impending doom, I think. But but things that, at least in the, the last week or, or two, seem to have, have maybe improved in some ways. Like, like um, in the sense that, in the sense that I feel like for the first time in a long time, there have been signs that um, that heroism can still be a thing, and that that virtue can still win the day. Um, and uh, I, I hope that we're able to maintain that. But but it does seem like that's a a stark shift from like the last six or seven years. Let's <laughs> say. You know, I just want to be careful. I, mean, I I don't know what images and commentary and analysis to trust coming out of Ukraine because it's a very chaotic situation. Uh, and uh, as much as I want to believe that the heroism of the Ukrainian people is going to stare down Putin, you know, it could all be understandable, morale-boosting talk that's not commensurate with what's happening on the ground. You hear a report saying, this isn't going as well for Putin as he would have liked. That may well be, but maybe Putin's going to readjust in a week and right. steamroll them, you know? So uh, I just don't want to... Uh, I mean, not, not that I have... I mean, if I'm a military planner, I have to be more concerned about making sure my information is correct so I'm not making mistakes. Um or, or in the case of the White House, you know, they're doing military plane, but they have to determine uh, their own their own diplomatic, economic, lethal aid pro pro providing strategies. Um, so I think everyone just to be careful not to presume too much about what we know is going on there. But to stay on the optimistic side of the ledger, uh, I think uh, rhetorically uh, there's... There's no hedging. You know, basically the entire world is aligned against Russia at this point. You know, R Putin has lost the public opinion war globally, from all I can tell. Uh, and I don't know if you would agree with me on this part of the point. Um, I'm sure a lot of Republicans wouldn't. But... I think the way that Biden has handled things has allowed for uh, us, Europe, NATO, and beyond to win that war. If we had been too belligerent in the run-up and gave Putin uh, you know, any kind of thin reed to grab onto and say, hey, it's not my fault, these guys are provoking us, these guys are threatening us on our border— that could have muddied the waters. And it's not just by me. I can go back to, you know, Putin, Obama, and Trump, you know, for, for various reasons. You know, uh, nothing of what they, you know, there's, there's a certain argument on the, on the DSA left that by entertaining the possibility that Ukraine could be in NATO or even that the fact that we expanded NATO in the 1990s um, was threatening to Putin. But uh, if anything, the fact that they invaded Ukraine is reason to understand why Ukraine would want so badly to be in NATO. Like they, they had a legitimate reason to want to be in NATO. Uh, and, uh, and I think we did a plenty of stuff to try to work with Russia, work with Putin, uh, even when you know, Poland and Hungary you know, were being added to NATO uh, we were clearly signaling to Putin, hey, we're not trying to encircle you. We want you to be part of global governance, just as we did uh, when we incurred, included you in the uh, in the UN Charter in the 1940s. Um, the way you reached out to Putin uh, or, or Russia, because it was Medvedev technically at that point, in the Libyan operation to get their assent, you know, to get the UN uh, approval for that, to work with Russia on the Iran nuclear deal. You know, this is all ways to say, hey, we're in this together. <laughs> We're not out to crush you. Um, 
So I think because all of that happened in the run-up, uh, I think has allowed for it to be crystal clear <laughs> Putin is 100% wrong and needs to be stopped. So when you have that rhetorical framework, it does make it easier to hold the line. Yeah, I, I think that um, I think Biden generally has done well um, in this and in, in about the last month. Remember, he gave a press conference at the end of January, where he made that that mistake about like if there's a, if there's a minor incursion, that's mm. you know. Um, but since then, I think he has done very well for Biden. Now, <clears throat> the State of the Union we're, we're talking on Wednesday morning. Mm-hmm. Um, I thought the State of the Union was um, was not great, Bob. Um, <laughs> it just it was okay. In but general, like, that's or, or Biden, specifically the Ukraine part you're talking about now, yes. Well. I, I, let me just say this. I just don't think Biden has the capacity to be um, the most inspiring leader by virtue of rhetoric, the way that, say, even Zelensky is. And some of that may be age. Some of it may just be, you know, who he is. But I think, by and large, Biden has been good. Um, but obviously, he doesn't have the capacity, I think, to explain, to teach and to inspire the way that you might want a leader to be able to do in a moment like this, you know, where um, we've seen that that we've seen that that leadership matters. I think Zelensky is a prime example of someone who has shown both, you know, physical courage and moral clarity, but also the ability to communicate effectively. I mean, the line, I don't need a ride, I need ammunition mm-hmm. or or you know, whatever, um, and, and and the ability to use social media. Um, I just don't think Biden can do that. And um, so we're, we're, we're never going to have, like, uh, imagine if, um, and th- this will be, uh, th- this will be uh, weird to do because Trump changed everything. But I mean, just imagine like if, if Marco Rubio were president giving a State of the Union in a moment like this. And you could you could certainly imagine someone like Rubio being able to inspire the country and explain Can I? Um, the situation in a way that I Am don't I think Biden I'm going to try Rick. Am I, I'm imagining President Rubio on the dais. Okay, re, okay. Re, re, reaching yeah, for his, Pete, reaching let's, for his let's water bottle. Let's say Pete Buttigieg, maybe. I mean, someone, <laughs> I mean, someone well who hydrated. can communicate. If, if he was well hydrated, then yes, he could inspire perhaps. But he would need to drink thoroughly beforehand. <laughs> um, I just so I, I guess what I would say is I give Biden probably a B in the last month, uh, which is fine, which is which is a a passing grade. Um, but um, but again, I think the um, the contrast between leaders who can inspire. And those who can't is is pretty stark right now. Well, I mean, I I, I think I mean you do need to be you need you need a degree of inspiration to get people on board. Uh, if people don't know what's going on or are confused or don't understand the stakes, you can lose your your unity. Uh, but we seem to be poised to pass an aid package to Ukraine by next week with a big bipartisan vote. It's not done yet, of course, but you know, Mitch McConnell sounds wide open to it. There's no grand philosophical dispute about what's trying to be done here. Uh, so now that, that the Republicans are going to every line item just yet, but like, I, th- I think the, the differences are, are relatively small uh, so I'm expecting it to happen. And so if you can garner that kind of vote for a substantive, substantive package, you have done the requisite amount of inspiration to get to that point. Um, if for some reason that all fell, falls apart, then you'd say, hey, Biden didn't lead until – and gave people reason to try to score political points and not put country above party. Um, now, and I think on, on, the, on the, in the same vein – you know, Europe is united. NATO is united. You know, Putin hasn't found the weak link there. 
Uh, and, you know, that's not all Biden, but obviously he plays a role in that. Um, now, yeah. let's say I, I think I think Biden. Well, I think Biden and, and, and America have done a, a good job of doing the right things. Mm-hmm. Um, but I think the inspiration has come from Ukraine. Well, but I, mean, I that's, but, but but that's, it's, that's a team. Not bad. it's a team. Effort. I mean, I mean, this should be Ukraine led. This should not seem like America dictating everything. If it seems like we're helping people in need, that is the ideal framework. Um, yeah. So I don't think you I think that's right, to overshadow I do what that, he's doing. No, I think you're totally right about that. But I do think that. Um, but Biden, I, I think what would be helpful from the president is if this thing starts to turn south, <clears throat> which it might, uh, because it's hard to imagine Putin being willing to lose, regardless of what that takes. Um, I think it's important to have the American public understand, A, why is it important um, for America to stand with Ukraine from a from the standpoint of, of, of moral authority, from the standpoint of, I mean, to be honest with you, containment and, mm-hmm. and deterrence. Mm-hmm. But then I think simultaneously it needs to be explained, but here's why we're not gonna like impose a no-fly zone. Here's why we don't wanna have a direct uh, you know, conflict with Russia. Um, I don't know that the American public in general, understands that, and and certainly Biden has not, I think, communicated that. Well, I yet. Mean, well, I agree with you in part. I don't. I don't think you need extra rhetorical labor to explain to people why a no fly zone would lead to a shooting war with Russia. I think that's that that's an easy thing to communicate. What is potentially? I don't know, man, because there is a. I mean, look, I'm, you know, you know me. I'm mm-hmm. very like I'm very pro Ukraine. I'm very anti appeasement. But having said that, I mean, you and I have both seen how things spiral out of control. And like once you like there's an excitement in the air right now in the media, uh, some saber rattling and, and that sort of thing. And so I think and we've seen people like Adam Kinzinger say we should impose a no fly zone. And so I think it, there's a danger that like, you know, once you're sort of in this thing and you're obviously rooting for the good guys, like how can you not blow up that convoy that's heading toward Kiev or wherever, you know? I well, mean, how, how I, can you let- I think the let reason why that? the bipartisanship has come together pretty readily is because we don't see the two parties on different sides of the boots on the ground argument. You know, pl- I think far more Republicans are in sync with Biden and saying, we don't want direct military conflict with Russia. It's not the that's not the goal here. Um, everyone, I think, I think there's wide um, appropriate trepidation of getting into a shooting war with it with a with a giant nuclear power. Um, what I think is potentially harder, and we're not not at that point yet, but where I think your your argument would more readily come into play is, let's say, our aggressive economic sanctions lead to blowback. You know, right now the rhetoric from Biden is we're going after their economy in a way that's not going to disrupt our economy, which is obviously an ideal thing to try to accomplish, but it might not work as intended. You know, what if gas prices really shoot up? What if there are cyber attacks that disrupt our internet usage? Our, that, that, so our daily conveniences are now uh, in upheaval. Then you might get Americans saying, I didn't sign up for that. I mean, hey, these Ukrainians, they seem pretty cool. Uh, I like that Dancing the Stars video that I saw on Twitter. But hey, I, I, I still want my internet. I still want to be able to get, fill up my car without breaking the bank. Um, that's where if Biden hasn't fully communicated the stakes, you might start seeing a disintegration of American unity. Um, we're, we're just not at that point yet because we haven't had that kind of disruption in our own lives. And I think that's um, I think that's important. Obviously, the the main concern is is what's happening right now in Ukraine. But I also think there's a problem where you know, for the last decade, uh, we've seen the American right becoming more and more pro-Putin, and it seems like 
for the time being, that spell is broken. But, you know, you could imagine them, you know, um, getting their groove back if once they can point to things like, you know, I mean, I'm just trying to think of the propaganda, but it's like, you know, why are we so concerned about something happening uh, 6,000 miles away when gas prices mm-hmm. here I mean, Tucker, are Tucker Carlson whatever. made that point directly. Um, and okay, but when the gas prices really are that yeah. high, people will agree with them. More, more <laughs> so, readily, yes, I agree. Um, at least there's a totally great potential for that. Uh, you know, this is a real test for... Unless, both- wait, unless the leader, unless a leader were able to really do what we did to Russia when we were able to preempt their pretext. By saying, like, this is going to happen, they're going to say this, let's do that again here domestically. I mean, maybe if we if we see coming down the pike that Russia's planning something that is going to, you know, hurt us in some way, it would behoove Biden to get ahead of that and communicate that uh, in, in the way they did with the military operation. But I, th- I think what you're, just the, 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 the pessimistic scenario you're describing I think it's not just a test for Biden. It's also a test for Republicans. You know, Republicans need to um, settle what part, what party are they? What What is their foreign policy orientation? Are they a Trumpian America first? Let's be buddies with Putin and Kim Jong-un party. Um, let's let all the horrible uh, autocrats of the world do whatever the heck they want as long as they say nice things about Donald Trump. Uh or is it a more Reaganite, hawkish party with more of an internationalist outlook that says if these if these actors go unchecked on the global stage, it's disruptive not just for American security, security but global security. Um, it may not be capitalism versus communism, but it is democracy versus autocracy, and we can't let the autocrats um, dictate how this world functions. Uh, and from what I can, as far as the past week is concerned, the more internationalist minor Republicans have had the upper hand. You know, McConnell, True, but that's- Rubio, Graham, uh, they're the one, Romney, you know, they are wide open with working with Biden on Ukraine aid, and Trump and Tucker have had to change their tone and acknowledge that what Putin is doing is bad. Uh, when, when, you know, before that point, they both said very much sympathetic to what Putin was doing. But that's also what always happens when, I mean, (laughs) right now, so Russia invaded Ukraine. Russia's obviously the bad guys. Ukraine put up this heroic resistance and are fighting back uh, and surprising everybody. So if you're an opportunist who's just going with the wind, you know, you're sort of, you're just going with the flow, like, of course, Right now, you would be a hawk. Um, but what's it going to be like in a month or two? Like, that's my concern. And um, so I'm not surprised that right now, you know, Republicans have rediscovered their Reaganite, you know, cold warriors. But like, right now, everything's going right for that. Well, but but I, don't, I, don't think, I don't think that's happenstance. I mean, people did things. To create that environment, uh, I, I think chiefly Biden, uh, by the way he handled the run up. <clears throat> but I think credit goes to the McConnells and the and the Rubios and the Grams and the Romneys uh, because in the, they haven't been completely hands off Biden. They, they they get in their digs. I'm not saying they did. They don't. Uh, but they've not let the digs. Di- they've not let those uh, little jabs get in the way of trying to get the right policy in place to help Ukraine. And they haven't been pushed around by Trump and Tucker. They haven't let Trump and Tucker dictate how the party is going to function. Those, those who are actually elected in power in Washington. Let me throw, let me throw a weird uh, theory at you. Um, so for the last decade, Trump has been, not Trump, Putin. It's so easy to conflate the two. <laughs> Putin has been, Sorry. Putin has been using these active measures and propaganda to try to, um, you know, change American minds, you know, about there's Russia TV and, you know, that Putin's actually a good guy. He's really a Christian and he's fighting for Western value, you know, all that stuff. Right. Um, And that's worth a lot. Like 
financially, like the prop the pro Putin, pro Russia propaganda we have been fed for the last decade is worth a lot of money if you had to put a price tag on it. But what about like movies like Red Dawn and and the Rambo movies and like like now granted those movies are now you know 35, 40 years old in some cases. Um but I just you know I don't call them propaganda. I think that they were actually like legitimate art, you know, artistic, uh, you know, films that were created for for commercial value that maybe tapped into patriotism. Um, but like, I just don't think you can discount the value of those films, like a Red Dawn. People my age, your age, Bill, and any anyone near, like any Gen X person. Like we grew up on like a steady diet of of movies like Red Dawn, and so um, that's that. Just like Putin is a product of of the Cold War and thinks that the the collapse of the Soviet Union was like the the biggest you know disaster or or whatever he said it was, and he wants to reconstitute the Soviet Union. There's got to be a lot of people like us who grew up like with Russia as the bad guy and, and, and we just don't, aren't going to trust a former KGB agent. I can't believe you left Rocky four off of your list, Matt. That was very well, uh, Rocky disappointing. Four won the, won the cold war, but <laughs> right. we know that seriously. Um, and, it, and if I could change <laughs> and you could change, everybody could change. Now, I don't, I don't know if you recall right when Trump was elected, I had a big piece in Politico about the ABC miniseries America with a K, which envisions a Soviet takeover of the United States. Uh, it was very bloated, you know, week long miniseries that got kind of had a lot of hype going in and then was kind of a ratings bust, um, but was disturbingly, disturbingly relevant once Trump got elected. Um, and. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I I like Red Dawn like any Gen Xer. I'm not going to pretend otherwise. But I don't think it was the critical ingredient to uh, one winning the Cold War or even shaping good policies to win the Cold War. Um, you know, all these things give a very simplistic notion of you know what what to do. Uh, I mean, just I'm like, saying. Shaping our attitudes and ingraining with us a visceral distrust and dislike of Russia. Like Putin has been spending a lot of time and money uh, with, you know, phony media outlets and RT and Twitter mm -hmm. bots trying in the last decade, trying to shape mm -hmm. our values and our and, and re, our perspective. But he's up against Mm -hmm. Hollywood that once upon a time mm -hmm. like was making movies I'm not saying that they ended the Cold War actually mm -hmm. or that they that they really had any good policy prescriptions but they shaped our values and like if you had to put a price tag on like what is like the cumulative effect of Rambo First Blood Part 2 Red Dawn and let's say Rocky 4 like if 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 the American government created those movies as anti-Russian propaganda, they would have done a hell of a good job because, like, <laughs> I don't know how many million people saw those movies <laughs> and and how it shaped people our age and and uh, around our age. I mean, what I, where I see the problem is people then have very two-dimensional views of entire people, uh, which can lead to, you know. Bad policy choices. Um, I mean, to to Ronald Reagan's credit, he saw the opening with Gorbachev and he took it. Uh, there are people on the right that weren't happy with him when he was doing that. <laughs> didn't want to. Oh yeah. Didn't want to do the I, the INF treaty. Um, you know, didn't trust that Gorbachev was really what was the real deal. Um, and look, we're in this period now where you know Mitt Romney's taking a victory lap. <laughs> Uh, because he said Russia was our top geopolitical foe in 2012, and Obama said, you know, the 80s called, they want their foreign policy back. Um, and I think it's fair to say, you know, hey, uh, Romney was right in that we should be very mistrustful of Putin, 
but it doesn't, to me, it didn't logically, when you look at what he actually wrote, and I don't have it right in front of me, I, was, I didn't come prepared, apologies, but from what I, my recollection, uh, you know, he didn't like that we were trying to work with Putin diplomatically. Uh, he didn't like, this was after 2012, he didn't like that we were working with Russia on the Iran nuclear deal. I forget what he said about Libya. Uh, but I, my guess is he probably didn't like that either. Um, and I think those were legitimate diplomatic uh, endeavors. What, one, they worked. <laughs> uh, now you might say, well, I don't like the way Libya turned out. I don't like the way the Iran nuclear deal turned out. Uh, I, would, I, would, I, would, I would not agree with you if you made that point, but that's going a bit too down the, deep the, on the rabbit hole. Uh, my point is, is that... Uh, you can be mistrustful of Putin and still develop a more sophisticated, nuanced foreign policy uh, that tries to mitigate his behaviors and keep him, you know, you know, inside the tent, not outside the tent. Um, now, that shouldn't mean that we let him run roughshod over bordering republics. <laughs> um, and you can certainly knock Obama for what happened in Crimea. You can knock George Bush for what happened in South Ossetia. <laughs> um, um, but... Uh, you know, real world politic is more complicated than what you're going to get out of the movies. Uh, and trying to communicate that gets harder when people get all jacked up that when there's good guys and bad guys. Now we're at a point where like Putin is unequivocally being the bad guy. Uh, and because we didn't do bad things in the run up, it makes it much easier to communicate that. But if I think if we had a Romney-esque view in the last 10 years and we weren't trying to work with Putin, maybe this point in the process would be a lot harder to navigate. Or, I mean, you can't say that we got to a good place. I mean, we've had four presidents who, um, you know, George W. Bush looked into his eyes and saw into his soul or whatever, right? The Obama, Obama, who... Um, you know, I guess it was was with Medvedev. You know, I just see just wait till I win the election and I have a little more space to, you know, mm -hmm. just obviously. And then the red line, Obama's red line. I mean, I think that I think that Putin looked at Obama and saw this sort of a feat cosmopolitan liberal that he could walk all over. And I think he did. And then Trump, like Putin's buddy. <laughs> <laughs> who did do some tough policies against Russia, but maybe because he felt like he had to because everybody yeah, assumed. Any, anything that was tough on Russia was not led by Trump. That was that was the. It could be just the Trump administration or, you know, other people in the administration, like the John Boltons or the, the whoever. Um, and, and now we are where we are. I mean, you know, I mean, the, 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 maybe, the, Ro maybe if maybe if Romney, maybe if Romney had been president, we wouldn't be where we are. Maybe we'd be in a better place. Maybe Putin would not have thought that he could have uh, gotten away with such. I mean, we'll never you know, be able to run, run the, the, the counterfactual, but I would think having seen Putin and where, where Putin has ended up here, he seems pretty hell bent on doing this. I mean, this, this is his life's goal to reassemble you know, the boundaries of, you know, greater the Russian empire. Uh, it's not like this moment in time was so ripe to do this. Uh, everyone was being so soft and so feeble that it seemed like it would just be a cakewalk. Um, I disagree. I mean, if, if you're looking at America, now would be a great time if you're looking at America. So with Trump, you know, I think Trump's sort of a loose cannon, you know, Maybe Trump rolls over and says, like, hey, what, what do we care about NATO? Um, that's Putin's sphere of influence. Or maybe Trump says, people are going to think I'm weak. I, don't, I can't look weak, uh, just like he killed uh, Soleimani. So I think that Trump was sort of a loose cannon. Now you've got Biden. He's at like a 37 percent approval rating. Um, you have Putin has apologists and supporters in the American media. Um, you've got the Republican Party that is still a mess. I mean, we've seen the stuff with Marjorie Taylor Greene and white, you know, white nationalists and the, the, the behavior uh, at the State of the Union. I mean, if I'm looking at America, I'm thinking these people are divided and weak. This is a great time to make my move. I mean, you don't think Putin would have tried disinformation campaigns 
employed communication strategies like RT, um, cultivate, um, you know, uh, useful idiots. <laughs> Even if Romney was president in 2012 and thereafter, I mean, again, this was this was not some sort of side project for Putin. Like this is what he wants to do with his life, um, and he would take he would take any opportunity of belligerent action by the U.S. to justify what he was doing. I mean, which he's tried to do all this time. He has had, he hasn't had a whole lot to work with, which is why he gets to this point. He tries to he had to make a, a rambling, nonsensical speech full of uh, you know f- made up history. To justify his action, uh, I, yeah. I, I mean, again, we can't no no, <laughs> um, but uh, I think it's my it's all opinion. Um, it, when you go back to you know twenty twelve, you know Putin. This was before Putin intervened with our elections. This is before Putin took things that far. Um, so I think there was a little bit of an attitude, perhaps, you know, uh, short-sighted that, you know, Putin sucks, but he's staying in his backyard. He can only take things so far. Uh, and he's not the only bad actor in the world. We got to deal with Saudi Arabia. We got to deal with uh, uh, a, whole, a whole host. We got to deal with China. We got to deal with a whole host of people who are not, who are not freedom, freedom lovers and live on this, live on this planet. So um, how do we, and, and Russia's got more nukes than most of them. So we got to find a way to work with this guy. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's not a crazy notion. Uh, and so everything that, that Putin does bad under Obama, I mean, the, the biggest things, you know, you know, was killing journalists, um, taking over Crimea. I think there's still this attitude like, well, but, but we, we did work with him on Libya. We, we get more Medvia. If Putin wasn't happy with what happened with Libya. Uh, so again, at that point in, in, in the first term, it's not even Putin who's, who's president. So there's still this possibility that Putin's not going to come back, that maybe he's not calling all the shots. And he didn't call all the shots because he, he did not like Medvedev giving the tacit okay for Libya. Uh, then, of course, Putin comes back uh, and, uh, and Crimea happens, you know, in the Obama second term, uh, which, again, is not great. But I think people check, still have an attitude of like, it's over there. Uh, then... He's actively interfering with the United States election. I, I think that is a big tipping point, especially for Democrats, because they're the ones who got screwed by it. Um, like you know, th- this is this is rising to a whole other level of malevolence, and requires a reorientation of thinking. Um, uh, and uh, you know, if, if Romney was being belligerent towards Putin. Why wouldn't Putin interfere the American elections at that point to try to get someone else in there? Uh, I'm not saying it wouldn't have happened. I'm just saying I think Romney had a worldview which said um, these are these are adversaries. These are not our partners. These are not our allies. Putin is a bad person. Um, We need to have policies that will deter him, that will let him know that we will not tolerate. What were those policies? I mean, that's that's where I think Romney. Should have to, should have been. Should, I mean, again, what Robert, Robert's right or wrong is not like the most important questionnaire. But we're still trying to. But in, in terms of learning from this, so we we're faced with a similar situation in the future. What do we do? This is a big open question. What were the great deterrent policies that we didn't do? It's not obviously what those things were. Yeah, I, I don't know. I will say this. I think that when you draw a red line, and then you don't do what you said you were going to do, that tells bullies and bad actors that you're weak and that they can, that they can push you around. Like I'm a believer. It's basically like a school. It's like the playground, essentially. Um, I think that, and then you remember America, like, uh, then we like invite in Russia. You, you guys, ha- you guys handle this. You, you take care of Syria negotiated. And then as recently as, as cutting and running from, Afghanistan and aban- we've abandoned our allies uh, time and again. Um, you had Trump saying that, you know, being critical of NATO um, and, and, and these sort of uh, rules based international order. Uh, I just think we sent Putin bipartisan now. I think we sent Putin a lot of messages that we're weak, we're not going to stand up for our friends. Um, you could probably get away with uh, bullying others and, and we're going to let you do it. I think I think we sent him that message that like 
we're going to let you get away with doing bad stuff. And we're not going to stop you because we didn't. Well, so we abandoned. I mean, that's our not friends. just like, we, that's, not, that's we, not just bipartisan failure. I think this was American desire. <laughs> um, most Americans for the last decade don't want to see America overextended militarily in the world. Um, no one was mad about leader. leaving Afghanistan. No one was mad about not getting involved in a Syrian quagmire. Um, these were things that that was a response to public appetites. Now, that's why you need leaders who do the right thing and and bring along the public with them. But so, but persuade what, but, the public. Again, I, I, I'm not trying to. We didn't have that. I'm not trying to plant my own flag here, but just for the sake of discussion. I mean, and I don't, I'm not trying to negate what you're saying because I, I I agree that if you send those kinds of signals, they they can be interpreted the way they, they can be interpreted. Um, but it doesn't automatically follow that. Okay. Let's let's occupy Syria for the next twenty years. Let's never leave Afghanistan. It's not obvious to me that doing those things automatically are, are Putin deterrence. They could very well have just sapped us dry. Um, they could have caused further dissension on the home. Putin might have said, "Hey, they're tied down. These places I can go here, and they don't have the they can't they can't stretch as far well, to deal with me." Bill I, Bill, I think you make a valid point because all we have to we don't have to imagine the possibility of this. If it wasn't for Iraq. None of this would have happened. <laughs> I mean, you know, everything, uh, what, the way that Iraq went sideways leads to every, like, leads to Obama, mm -hmm. leads to Trump. You know, it leads to America basically becoming, you know, to a certain degree isolationist mm -hmm. or withdrawing from, from the world or just, you know, the psychology that you're, t you just said for the last 10 years, Americans haven't wanted to be, like, you're right. Mm -hmm. And the part of the reason is that we went into Iraq and it didn't, we didn't, Either we shouldn't have gone ahead or we should have done it better. Mm -hmm. But whatever, you know, whatever you believe about that, um, yes, that that like this has their backlashes. And it's it's ironic that sometimes you think you're projecting strength and what you're doing is actually setting up down the road, uh, especially in a democracy where we have to respond to the public eventually. Uh, you're setting up disaster. Well, uh Bill, Bill, let me. Um, uh, I want to bring up an, another point real quick. Sure. If, if if that's cool. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't because I haven't heard anybody really talk about this as much as I think uh, that it should be. Vladimir Putin has nuclear thousands of nuclear weapons. Okay. Um, he is uh, going into Ukraine now. We had a deal. Russia, England, and America had a deal. It's not a binding deal, but we basically said to Ukraine, if you give up your, your weapons, we will honor your territorial integrity. Like Russia is obviously breaking that deal. I guess you could say that America in some ways has some obligation uh, to, to help police that. But whatever, it's not like Article 5. We don't, mm -hmm. We're not technically required to come to their aid. Mm -hmm. But Putin is going into Ukraine right now. And um, as I have said, I think that Oh, we should be providing moral support for Ukraine. We should be rooting for Ukraine. I think we should be providing material support for Ukraine um, in the way that Reagan did without having a direct confrontation with the Soviet, with Russia in this case, in Reagan's case with the Soviet Union. I mean, you know, in Charlie Wilson's war, I, I don't want to draw, I mean, Afghanistan and, mm -hmm. and, and Ukraine are, are like incredibly different scenarios, but, but the point being, we're on the side of the good guys but we do not want to have a direct confrontation with Russia with a nuclear power. Like I think that is smart. I think that's the right the right thing to do. But but Putin has these these nuclear weapons, and we are like we don't want to be involved in that. So like let's say he goes in, and eventually he's able to take Ukraine. Now maybe he uses tactical tactical nuclear weapons in the process if he has to. I just don't think Putin's willing to lose, right? Because he. He, ha he, he can't be perceived by history as a loser. He has to save face, he has to look tough, but whatever the case. What if he goes into Poland? Now, we have tr a lot of troops in Poland right now, I, I think, but, um, but if he really wants to reconstitute the Soviet Union, you know, like at some point, you know, he's gonna go into these like Warsaw Pact countries. I, I would think that's certainly within the realm of possibility. If he goes in there, we are obligated 
to defend Poland when NATO is obligated to defend Poland. But remember, Putin has nuclear weapons. Are we willing? Maybe this is too far down the road and maybe the strategic ambiguity thing, I get it. But like, at some point, the American public is going to be asked to say, like, are we willing to defend Poland? And like, I don't know when that... Well, I mean, I, there, I hope maybe we there's, there's one thing that, that Biden decision, was crystal but, clear about in the State of the Union was that we would, that we're going to defend every inch of NATO territory. He was very declarative about that um, in a way that Donald Trump was not, you know, talk about. Well, Trump could be president <laughs> when this happens. I mean, right. that's part of the problem. Right. He'll say, well, Paul, Paul you didn't pay He's your dues. Here, here you go, Putin. Are we willing to pay any price, bear any burden? Because I think, look, you could say, I, I, let me just present the, the counter arguments. On one hand, I think you could say, look, Poland's a long ways away. It's in their sphere of influence. It belong, you know, the Nazis had it, the Soviets had it. Um, you know, uh, Putin never called me a racist. Like, wh- why, why am I going to send my sons to, to defend Poland? Like, uh, that's an argument, right? And then there's the other argument, which is like, put aside the humanitarian, you know, concerns about the Poles. Um, if you let bullies start taking things that don't belong to them, they're just going to keep taking more. Like, where does it end? You know, um, and we have to we've made a, a promise to our allies. If we don't stand up for them, none of our allies could ever trust us. The, the, the whole concept of the alliance falls apart if you don't honor the agreement, like when the times get tough. What do you think, Bill? Well, I mean, I, I, I mean, you're making the case. I mean, a case that Biden, you know, essentially made uh, last night. I, I, I think. I mean, people get broadly that Putin is a bad guy with bad intentions and has no respect for human rights or basic freedoms, and there's not a guy that you want to have the dominant control over the world. And if you don't check him now, he, he will be unchecked and, he, and who knows where he would stop. Uh, I, I think that is pretty painfully clear at this point. Uh, and I don't think it would be hard to rally support to defend NATO territory on that basis. I mean, you have the massive problem that they have nukes uh, to try to... Uh, try to contain. I mean, the whole point of having all these nukes was so we wouldn't do this sort of thing because we mutually assured destruction. Um, but obviously- but, but, if Putin, but if Putin is really unhinged, right? I mean, we, we spent all this time trying to keep um, fringe characters and non-state actors from getting nuclear weapons with the premise being that major- like the nation states would have rational leaders who are acting in their own self-interest. But then we had Trump and now we have Putin or we've had Putin. And like, I don't know what, if it, you know, if would Putin rather die than lose his machismo? Like would Putin, like people commit suicide. Like would Putin rather die than be perceived by history as a as a loser as a weakling. I can't, I'm Maybe. Saying, I can't. I can't mind read him. I, I do think that Putin's ability to retain his own power is weaker than our ability to maintain our system of government. Uh, I, I I would imagine if things are ratcheting up to this sort of level where you're talking about you know bona fide world war, my guess is we would do all we could to, you know, take him out uh, and try to constitute some sort of regime change and, and, and liberate the country. Um, well, one possible hope we have is, you remember there was a story in the, in the Cold War where there was a, a Russian who, refu- who, like, saw a radar that there was a, a new kidding their way right. and chose not to report it up the chain of command. Right. Um, we, we, um, Ukraine, uh, uh, ethnically U- U- Ukrainian Russians and, 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 and allies within Russia have been um, undermining Russia during this. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you saw, they leaked some information uh, sort of, uh, of, of, of Russian soldiers. 
Um, there could be within the Putin government people who are sympathetic to the Ukrainian cause, who um, who might undermine him, uh, sort of a Russian deep state, if you will, <laughs> and, <laughs> who would and, not and, follow orders. And I think to get to that point, it's helpful for America and NATO to be seen as not antithetical to Russians broadly, um, to separate Putin from the rest of the country. Uh, and this is, again, why I think going down the Romney path wouldn't have been a good path, you know, because I, th I think we have more credibility to say, hey, we're not trying to get you. <laughs> we're not trying to to break you up. We're not trying to put you under our thumb. We have tried to incorporate you uh, in the governing of the world as we uh, has always have since the founding of the UN. And just to do a little, you know, plug for my 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 podcast, which I I, I know I've, I've yet to do episode two on, uh, and it haunts me every day, but I do want to get there. Um, you know, the beginning of the UN, you know, there's, there's, there's two parts of it which are very relevant to today. Yes, I've, I've seen people ask, why is it that Russia can veto these resolutions? Why are they even still on the Security Council when they're, uh, when they're doing what they're doing? You know, this is make a farce of the UN. This was a key sticking point in how to get the charter approved because it, the question was raised, what happens when there is a resolution put forth involving a dispute where a permanent member has veto power? Does the veto apply to that situation? And Stalin was very adamant that you damn well right it does, because otherwise you guys are going to steamroll me. <laughs> the capitalist nations, because China at this point wasn't hadn't gone communist, all you guys are going to end up, we're in the crosshairs, and we don't have the veto, you're going to agree, and then uh, we're out of luck. So that doesn't work for us. Um, and they came up with a compromise that basically said, okay, if it's a Pacific matter, not a military matter, then you don't have, then you don't have the veto. But if it's a military matter, then you do. Uh, which a lot of Americans want to, because they, they don't want to give up their sovereign right to use military power if they're in a dispute. Um, they didn't think, a lot of folks didn't think that that, that treaty would get ratified if, if such a clause wasn't in there. So that's why they have the power. I mean, that, that literally was litigated at the very beginning. Uh, and the other thing that was an issue at the very beginning was the status of Poland, because um, America was trying to have Poland be democratic, and Stalin was getting it, already had his mitts in there. Uh, and... Uh, Russia, tr Soviet Union tried to get Poland admitted as a initial member of the United Nations, and we were like, "This is this is not a real country at this point. This is your you've dominated this country," uh, and we rebuffed that. Uh, and in fact, when we rebuffed it, a lot of Americans didn't like the way we did it because <laughs> we essentially beat them in the vote and didn't come to a negotiated compromise. And they thought that you know we were you know. We were we were flexing our muscles too much, uh, and, and at the same time we were admitting we 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 admitted Argentina, which had Nazi adjacency, and so Russians called us hypocrites that we were letting Argentina in and not letting Poland in, and a lot of Americans accepted that. A lot of people inside the State Department thought that the Secretary of State Edward Satinius was wrong in uh, navigating it that way, but. Argentina came in because they needed to keep the Latin Americans in, uh, in play. They were they were threatening to walk if Argentina wasn't there. Anyway, um, uh, and then it was to solve the veto dispute. It involved uh, an emissary going to Stalin, who had just negotiate a Poland deal, which essentially was giving up and say, okay, look, you guys are going to have this and we get that. We're going to, we're going to gloss it and make it look that way, but we all know what's really happening here. And once you kind of soften Stalin up with Poland, Poland then uh, gave up any resistance on the veto question. Um, uh, so that's why we are where we are. We had a, lot, a lot of this is part and parcel of how we decided the world was going to work post-World War II. Uh, and the idea that these powers are essentially going to maintain global security with a degree of consensus was always challenged from the very beginning with, with, with these tense discussions and then in the immediate aftermath of things like the Korean War. Um, so it's always been tough. <laughs> Managing the Russians has always been tough. Uh, 
And uh, and some people look at that and say, well, you know, FDR sold us out of Yalta and sold us out and the UN was stupid. Uh, and yeah, I think you have to argue with them. What, what, what was the alternative? <laughs> what was the alternative going to be any better? Um, we did maintain a tense and unpleasant stability which was superior to what we had preceded the UN with World War One and World War Two. Uh, so these are the tough questions. But a lot of what's happening right now, you know, there's a there's a, there's a real d- direct line with where we where we came from and out of World War Two. Uh, yes, indeed, it's a dangerous world. We live in interesting times, and um, let's just hope that uh, you know that that Ukraine can endure and that um, Putin is not crazy and or that the uh, oligarchs uh, <laughs> find a way to find a way to oust him, mm-hmm. which is, uh, you know, not 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 entirely implausible. So those would be, I think, the best scenarios. And, and simultaneously, I don't think we should get sucked into a, a direct confrontation. I think Poland is obviously the red line. Um, but, uh, if are, we are can you, make this Putin's Afghanistan, are you then, pre- um, are you prepared to salute Joe Biden's leadership if, if Putin is actually taken out on his watch? Yeah, I'll give him credit. I mean, like I, I wrote a piece, uh, last week saying, I forget the headline that they put on it, but basically saying that Putin's done a good job and like, you know, cause people were saying that Putin you or know, Biden, sorry. <laughs> this one, I, I should not conflate these two. I wrote, <laughs> thank you for the cat. Always, always correct me uh, in real time when I say stupid things. I wrote a piece last week saying that Biden had done a good job uh, because I think people were sort of blaming Biden uh, for this Russian invasion, which is, uh, I think, silly. So um, I give Biden credit. Like I say, I think he deserves you know, like a, a, a B or a B plus in, in the way he's handled it. He's never going to be the inspiring rhetorical leader. That might be nice to have. Um, but I think he he did a lot of things right uh, in the last month. And so I give him credit for that, just like I, you know, gave Obama credit for getting bin Laden, which was a, a huge get. I mean, if uh, if if Putin falls, then uh, good for Biden. Well, let's end it on on that note. Uh, good to have you back in the DMZ. Yeah, good to be back here in in the DMZ, and uh, we'll have to, you know, don't don't be a stranger. <laughs> you know, I have, I have a puppy now, which is just killing me work wise. So it's, it's it's it's. I apologize. It's been hard to schedule schedule these sessions while I'm walking this dog constantly. But uh, we I don't will- think people realize uh, how a puppy could derail. A juggernaut like I, the DMZ. I, I, I did but. not. I had no idea going in. How much is this? I mean, you might have noticed, like, I'm not even writing all that much these days. It's because I got this dog to deal with. So it's not like, it's like I don't want to. It's, it's like I don't want to earn my keep. But uh, I'm, I'm struggling. We got to get that puppy trained because America needs Phil share. I mean, if, now more than ever. So. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll talk soon. You got it. Take care. Yeah.